So as promised, uh, I was going to kind of do some practical little examples here and show a movie so you can get some like familiarity with operating fluid bed. Uh, before I jump into that, one of you asked me a question which I thought was a good question. Just want to clarify. Can't remember or see where you're at, but anyways, well. You just said aluminum isn't good for an oxygen carrier. Why do we put it in rocket propellants? So again, if, if, you didn't, if you didn't catch that or you had that thought, remember what I said is it's not a good oxygen carrier. It's a great fuel, <laughs> right? It burns great. But once it's burned, how do you get it back to being aluminum? It takes a lot of energy, right? That's why I said you have to go through this haul process. So it, it doesn't work as an oxygen carrier that's thermally regenerated could work great as a fuel, and we're going to get to that here in, in just a second. But you've got to figure out what you do with the oxidized form of that fuel to get it backwards. So I want to make sure that was clear. So let's jump back into fluidization here. I've got on the screen there a uh, graphic that's actually a, a CFD simulation of the uh, chemical looping reactor that we run in our laboratory. It's, you'll see a photo of it here in a minute. It's about 15 feet up in this direction. Um, so I'm showing you actually how this works in the lab where this is the air reactor. It has a, a, a cross-sectional area that's you know, a little bit larger and then it necks down to transport solids up. So here the uh, velocity of the gas is actually a little bit larger than the transport velocity in this region. So you have a very turbulent bed being pulled up and then when you neck down then you really accelerate the material and the only purpose up in here is to get you up to the top to create enough hydrodynamic head for the processes in this region. Notice I said enough hydrodynamic head. So think about this like a fluid, right? It's fluid beds. I'm going to ask you, where is the pressure in this system the highest? Think about it like a fluid. Where is it the highest? What's that? At the very bottom, right, down in here, right, because you have all that material piled up on here. It's that pressure right at that point that is pushing the fluid out into this region where you're taking material out, right? And so this is actually the L valve that's controlling the solids flow into the system. This is how you control the flow rate, how quickly that material is spinning around the system. It's brought up into this region, separated out centrifugally in a cyclone dropped into the loop seal. Remember I talked about loop seal? That separates the oxygen in the air that's up in this region from the fuel and the product streams in this region. And then I can control the height of this bed just by restricting the flow rate through here. I'll build up a little bit more. Once it gets to steady state, there's a pressure that's established here that I'm actually counteracting with how much I fluidize. So I can set that level how I need to to give enough residence time to convert the fuel. Okay, so that's how the thing actually works. I, uh, we talked about where's the pressure, what controls the circ rate, and what the loop seal does. So just so you can actually see this on the next uh, slide here, I've got a movie that'll show you in cold flow uh, all those processes. So it's, I just think it's instructive. So you'll see that, if I can get this started right there. Uh, you'll see in the background there, there's a, you know, a, a cold you know, version of what we just described. Here's the L valve. It's not actually got a sharp right angle, but you can see the material coming this way. And then it's blown up through this part of the reactor. But take a look, and when it stops, I'll ask you a question. Which way does it look like to you the material is moving in that part of the vessel? Which way does it look like? You think it looks like moving on? OK, we'll go back a minute here. Here's the, the flow coming out of that L valve. Look at how irregular it is. It's regular in the mean. But you can see there's kind of this starting and stopping. And uh, you know, if you put pressure taps in there, you can see those fluctuations. I don't know, to me, that region looks like it's going down. All right? It is. <laughs> but the bulk of the material is going up. It comes down and rains down on the walls because the wall friction slows the gas down. And so, really, what happens in those processes is the material is often moving down right at the walls while the core flow is taking it up. You can see very irregular system. I guess I could go back one more time and just let's quickly see if we can play that just so you don't miss all the fun here. Because it's just instructive to me to see these things physically. So again, you know, you can see the material. It looks like it's raining down in this region, and it is right at the walls. 
the material in the core is actually moving up. So when you say that right away, you start to realize the complexity of controlling reaction rate, right? Because I have material that is recirculating in this direction, but the core material is moving up. So I have this mixture of resonance times going on in what I think of as a bulk flow device. In fact, it's not. And so here you can see material taking on a longer resonance time in the system at the bottom of this L valve before it's drawn into the flow that's carrying it upward. Not quite steady, but uh, depending on the fluidization rate, you get different flow rates through that system. So again, just a close up view, material right at the wall coming downward, you know, with gravity right in the boundary layer at the wall. The material in the core is flowing up uh, very rapidly. And here you can see the cyclone separating that material out dropping then down into, in chemical looping, you would have a loop seal right there. So you get a sense of, you know, the unsteadiness that's involved in the process. You get a sense of, like, how does the, the, the solid actually move through the system looking at those. So I just introduced you to fluidization, and all I really talked about was hydrodynamics. You also need to have that stuff reacting. You need to look at the extent of conversion and you got to worry about heat transfer. So now it starts to get even more complicated. If you wanted to design a solid fuel chemical looping boiler, what, what's, what's the best reactor look like? We, we've not actually built them before, and I, I've already shown you there's distinct differences between this and say like, say like a, a, a boiler or something like that. There are a whole bunch of trade-offs on the auction carrier, and uh, so it starts to get pretty cumbersome. How do I design? the system to optimize the performance of the carrier, the heat transfer, the conversion. Well, some of those issues are pretty hard to do at a design level just intuitively. Some you can, but really I think we're going to rely more on, you know, CFD. And uh, there is a whole community, and uh, one of the world's experts, my colleague Madhav Shamlau at NETL, has developed, he and his colleagues, the multi-phase flow interface exchange code, MFIX, and uh, you can actually download this. If you have to work in this area or you decide you want to pursue uh, you know, multi-phase flow or chemical looping, this code will help you get a start in terms of doing simulations. I'm showing here an example simulation that they're doing for uh, uh, an activity where they're doing uh, uh, biomass to liquid fuel. So it's sort of like cat cracking with biomass pyrolysis products. The interesting thing about modeling fluidized beds, it is heterogeneous. You might think, well, we're combustion engineers. It's sort of like a spray, but it's not. It, in fact, is quite a bit different because the particles persist and the age of the particles matter. You know, I just showed you on the movie, you got some particles that are coming back down against the wall. So if those are reacting, those particles have more time in that part of the vessel so how do I model it as truly a like two fluid approximation between solid and liquid when I know that the age of some of those, like some of them might be an oxygen carrier that's fully reduced? Well, I have to distinguish that particle from the one next to it that isn't. And so it becomes really complex when you look at the age distribution of the particles in these reacting systems. The other thing that's interesting, unlike you know, a spray, the fluid can actually freeze it goes through a phase change to become a solid again, right? You fluidized it from a solid bed of material to make it behave like a fluid, but if your design is a little bit off and you have a dead region, what is it? It's almost like a solid again, right? So it is like a phase change, and if you fluidize it, you can get it back to being a liquid state if you get it before you form a clinker or something like that. So, uh, so the reaction kinetics, also very complex. The heat and mass transfer, it's a multi-scale problem. So uh, if you work in this area, there are great computational tools available. There's also much, much work to be done to make them address all the issues I just described. Uh, Sham, my colleague, is actually working on an exascale version of MFIX right now that would be part of the exascale challenge that the U.S. is pursuing within DOE. He's actually using chemical looping as his example problem. So I'm telling him, if it doesn't work, I'm blaming you, the modeling guys, right? No, <laughs> we, don't, we don't work that way. We know how hard this is. Just because of time, and I know you are going to want to hear about supercritical CO2 power cycles, I'm just going to breeze through a couple of these slides, and then we'll jump over to SCO2. So 
Uh, bear with me as I decide which we can skip over here. You know, the question is, if you were going to design the air reactor, you've got all this heat coming out of the oxidizing metal, how do you get it out of there? Well, it's an interesting problem to design that just because that's sort of the same problem you do with a circulating fluid bed combustor. This is kind of a schematic of a real circulating fluid bed combustor. You put coal into the bottom of the reactor and then it's carried up by the flow of gas, separated out in a cyclone, and it circulates around until all the carbon is basically gone, right? The uh, solid stuff is separated out in this cyclone before you go through additional heat recovery and then on through the final gas treatment. You can take these slides and work through them. The main message you know, to give you is the design of this thing to remove the heat depends on the kinetic rates, depends on how you decide to do it. There's an open design problem here just in terms of the configuration. So I'm just going to breeze through these so we get to uh, uh, supercritical CO2. But I give you on the slides a bunch of representative parameters, like on this slide, shows you the amount of circulation of solids or relative to air in typical systems. So if we say hydrodynamically, I want to stay close to what we know works, you can pull these slides up and look at, here's how I would design the thing. And it's interesting just to work through the numbers yourself. There's not really a research issue here. But I included the slides just to show right here and then right on here. There's a whole bunch of ways you could design the heat removal. You could design the linkages between the air reactor and the fuel reactor. Take the slides if you're interested in this area. You can work through them. If you really get into it, just give me a call. I'll be happy to talk to you. You might be the one that has the best idea about how to lay out the system. Our lab right now is pursuing a system optimization code we can compare all the different layouts that you might imagine so you can trade them off in a design space. It's really a tough problem because we don't have all the kinetics yet that we need, but uh, we're starting to find out where the important ones are. So uh, I'm going to skip over that and then I'm going to start to show you some results. So from our lab, recent research results. This is just fun to see where are we at right now in terms of developing chemical looping. The image here is actually our chemical looping reactor. This was the image or the, the CFD representation of what's inside of this device. It's what we actually run to do our tests at, in a full loop environment. And uh, if you want to go see really what's happening in this area, I would highly recommend getting the proceeding from this workshop. There are quite a few really good papers there. I think I counted the number 100 peer reviewed papers in five sessions on chemical looping. My point is, there's a lot of people working on this, and uh, so you can go in and read through all those papers, get a sense of where people are at. So I'm just going to show you some things that are happening in our lab right now. We're, we're focusing on technology development and perform we want to get to performance on coal, but we're doing these initial studies on natural gas in a full looping mode because we want to solve all the problems on a simple fuel before we jump to a more complex fuel. We're doing coal just in like single bed fluid reactors to get the kinetics right, to understand what happens in those. We're trying to make sure we get all the hydrodynamics correct in an actual uh, gaseous system. So here's what we're doing. Oh, I didn't know this was going to go through. So we're bringing together the kind of computational modeling I described, development of carriers. Uh, we have sensors to actually measure high temperature flow rates, and those are coming together in our experimental facility that I think it's about like 15 feet, as I mentioned before. So if you come see us or visit us, be happy to give you a little tour, take a look at what this thing actually looks like. So we've been focusing on a couple of different oxygen carriers. Uh, hematite is the stuff you just dig out of the ground. It's iron ore, it really is. And uh, if you just grind it up, you can use it as an oxygen carrier. Uh, we found out that you could actually make it react a little bit better and get a little bit deeper oxidation reduction if you just put an alkali in there like sodium, potassium. I think we use potassium. It's a, it's a catalytic effect for the process. So that's pretty easy and low cost to put on there. But then. We, I talked a lot about copper. We were having a discussion uh, earlier about, well, what about copper? It seems like the best one. Yeah, if you just look at like raw numbers, but when you actually just take copper and put it in a chemical looping carrier, at the temperature you're going to operate at, you're probably going to make globs of big clumps of copper, agglomerates, because it's soft. So one of the things we, we did, and this is my colleague Ranjani Sarawarde, and she realized she could get 
sort of the, a mixture of copper and iron and support it on alumina, really a great carrier. I think we've run this thing in like TGA, TGA or fixed bed tests, I can't remember. Like 1200 centigrade, I thought, it's just going to form a solid clump. It should be soft. Doesn't, doesn't do that. We've been able to run it without any agglomeration. That's never been a problem with this material. And uh, we've recently been able to make it in like ton quantities with an external supplier so we could run it in our larger device. So it, it has a lot of interesting promise. Uh, you get more performance as you move along the bottom here, but you also get what you pay for, <laughs> right? Copper is more expensive, and if I have to make it, then I got to worry about a manufacturing cost for the carrier. So this stuff, you just dig out of the ground and grind it up, and it will work, but the performance is actually not wonderful. So I'm showing here a plot of, this was done with methane, plotted against temperature. These are the three carriers I just showed you, and you can see here's that raw iron down here. Methane conversion, 0.2. Uh-oh, not so great, right? If I promote it, I can do a little bit better. I put an alkali on there, it'll promote it. And then if I use the one I mentioned earlier, the, the copper iron supported, I'm up above 80% here, and uh, so you can look at the conversion as a function of residence time and other factors, but my main point is right here, for all the test conditions, we get a lot better performance if you're using copper, and that copper iron is thermally neutral, a little bit exothermic in the fuel reactor. Like I said before, when we ran that most recently, I mean, they're drinking donuts and coffee while it's running. You try to run the iron and everybody's just waiting to see what's going to, you know, they got to keep everything balanced. Here we're just waiting for data to pour in because it's thermally balanced, right? So it's very easy to circulate it. You don't need to worry about the thermal balance with that material. So it sounds pretty good, but why can't we get the conversion any higher than what I just showed you, 80%? So I'm showing on this plot, this is a, a cutaway view of the reactor looking down into the fuel reactor, A to A. So that's the actual cutaway of that physical experiment. Here's the simulation looking down in here. I don't know why it squashed that, but you're looking down now. We took the thing apart, and you just run it cold flow. So look what happens as you look down on that bed. When we just run gas through it, you're looking down at the top. What do you see coming out of the top of the bed? Big bubbles, right? Well, it's a fluid. What happens when you pump air into the bottom of a, you know, an aquarium tank or something, right? Bubbles start rising to the surface, discrete bubbles. And those bubbles have the fuel with them. And if you can't get that bubble to break and mix that fuel out and contact the solid, it will not react, right? So you think, oh, bubbles are too big. I'm an engineer. How do I make them smaller? I'll put, I'll, I'll, I'll put a porous plate on there. Or I'll just make you know bigger hole. I'll, somehow I'll change the way I'm putting the gas in there. That'll help, right? What do you think? <laughs> Well, that's, that's what I would have thought, but I had to go talk to my fluidization friends. So you compare them in CFD here. Everything from a porous plate to six holes to four holes. Look at the size of the bubbles. They really don't change a whole lot. They're stuck in there, right, at that size. Why? Because hydrodynamically, a bubble reaches some equilibrium size, right? Think about in a liquid, you know, like water, when you see bubbles being introduced, they coalesce and they try to get to a size it is a hydrodynamic, actually it's a non-equilibrium, they'll keep growing right as you go up. This is a problem. I'm saying I want to do chemical loop and combustion, but hydrodynamically, how do I get the gas to interact with all of the carrier? So you, you might not want this geometry. It might be better to do a moving bed. If you look at, like, Professor Fan at Ohio State, big proponent of doing moving bed counter flow so I don't have bubbles, and he uses very large particles. It's a great idea. But then I have other issues with that approach in that for solid fuels, I have to distribute all the solid fuel evenly across what will be a very large bed. So there's trade-offs in terms of design that we have not fully resolved that limit the conversion in the fuel reactor. It's just fundamental issues in terms of how do I react any gaseous products with that carrier. Uh, Maybe one of you will solve that for us. I hope I've inspired somebody here to think, I got a solution for you. All right, so that would be great. Uh, we are busy thinking about it. Uh, it's not a showstopper. If you don't get complete conversion in that region, you could break the bed up and keep going, right? That's one of the things we're looking at. 
but we just want the most elegant solution because we don't want a bunch of different beds and claptrap and downstream converters. So let's go on here. Got to finish the talk about chemical looping off to talk about attrition. All right. I've got this particle in there that's carrying the oxygen in. It's going around that loop a bunch of times. So I can say, all right, I know I can do chemical looping in my experiment in our laboratory. It's about 50 kilowatts thermal. It circulates about 4 kilograms per second, or 4 kilograms per minute. Now, if I wanted to go to a power plant of 500 megawatts, 50 kilowatts, 500 megawatts, that's a factor of 10 to the fourth, right, from here to here. So that means my circ rate in that final design is going to go up by a factor of 10 to the fourth. So let's assume that power plant that I'm building makes 500 megawatts thermal. It's operating at, you know, 40% efficiency. 200 megawatts of electricity is coming out. I pick an average price of electricity around the country, and I start to realize my power plant is earning, selling about $24,000 per hour of electricity. All right, so that gives you an idea about, like, the value of that plant sitting there being able to operate. $24,000 an hour is coming out. Well, what does that mean if I scale all this up to 40,000 kilograms per minute? Why did I pick that number? Because I know people build FCC crackers with that number, right? You remember from a while back? It's that number. I repeated that right in here. So it's a reasonable scale to be operating at. 4,000 kilograms per minute is already practiced. Usually when you talk about circulation rates in the chemical looping literature, Circulation is per hour, so I'm going to convert that out. 2.5 mil 2 million kilograms per hour, zooming around inside the chemical looping process. Attrition of, the, whoop, attrition of the material is defined as the percentage that breaks off as fines and is lost per hour. So what's a reasonable number to expect there? You, I mean, you're going to abrade some material off. It's bumping into each other as it's moving through there. This is a pretty decent and realistic attrition number, 0.1%. I think it's probably doable in most FCC systems. So if I'm circulating this much around and I have this much attriting, I get 2,500 kilograms per hour broken out as attrition, even in a good system. If the material costs just a dollar per kilogram, which is pretty cheap, right? And that's like just iron. You know, you can buy, you know, refined iron for that level in bulk. All right, twenty-five hundred dollars per hour of material is just lost if I don't do something else. Are you willing to put up with that? You're making that much an hour, and suddenly I'm saying, "Oh, I got a great process for you. Ten percent now of your revenue." you have to take just, you know, put new material into the system. Probably not going to do it. And in fact, what we're seeing right now is attrition rates that are higher than that. I mean, just think about that. If it was 1% attrition rate, which is even lower than what we see in the lab, you'd be spending all your money replacing the material. Attrition is the issue, my opinion, with chemical looping. You can't have that high attrition level. So we're working on how to harden the carrier, how to avoid attrition, how to make a better carrier, robust carrier. But let's be realistic. You can't make an ex you need an inexpensive material, right? I can't afford, if I know I'm going to have to struggle with attrition, I can't afford really expensive materials. You should consider real-time reprocessing. And the OSU group you know, has just accepted that from get-go. If you listen to Professor Fan, who's really a leader in this stuff, he said, no, I'm I'm planning to build it in as part of my process. Well, that's not a bad idea, right? I don't have to worry about it if I just build that unit process in there as the fines are separated out, you know, in that process because they'll probably make it through the cyclone. You'll catch them in a bag house. You just separate them out and reprocess them and stick them back in. So it's not a showstopper, but it's a serious complication if you need to think about, right? So if you say, oh, I heard this great stuff on chemical looping. I'm going to go work that issue. Think about this issue carefully because it'll, it'll slow down your idea. You've got to be able to either reprocess it or make it extremely robust. So, so there's some, uh, some issues to deal with in chemical looping. So I started off with this discussion on, on energy conversion in general. 
I said, well, you got to have efficiency and you got to have low cost carbon capture. Yes, question. What's that? Say it one more time. In the existing coal power plants, there's nothing like attrition happening? There is attrition, absolutely. But don't forget, in a circulating fluid bed coal plant, the bed material is waste material anyway, like sand. So as it attrits out, you just capture it, and it's just a waste stream. It's combined with the ash, with the other things. Not a big issue, because it's not valuable. Here, the carrier, you're buying it and putting it in there, right? So it's a valuable commodity that goes in. It, and in fact, you could think of it as an additional fuel cost if you just lose it, right? But yeah, attrition's an issue in those systems as well. If you get too many fines collecting, you can defluidize the bed. So, good question. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, uh, if size is a function, if the attrition is a function of size, uh, do we have like optimized size for the um, immatized or whatever we're using? I mean, if we go smaller on size, are we solving the problem of attrition? Yeah, you're saying efficiency of the overall plant as a function of size. Yeah, of course, the, the general rule of thumb is in power plants, the bigger they are, the more efficient because you just cut down on volumetric losses and things. Um, and as I, earlier I said, boy, if we could change it so you could modulize this, so you'd pick some size to get high efficiency and then replicate it, you'd probably have an easier time moving the technology forward. So great question, great question. So on this slide, I just I want to point this out again, get you to think about like where this technology could go. I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, okay, I want to get a high overall efficiency. And interesting enough for chemical looping, I don't have anything here. I don't need a carbon separation unit. It's part of the process. So that goes away, right? But what about this part? Is chemical looping a good choice in efficiency? What do you think? Compared to what we do today, is it a like home run winner, clear winner? It's married. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. The chemical looping process avoids penalties of separating CO2, of making oxygen, but it, it still relies on the same basic cycle to generate power, right? So you don't get any benefit in that regard. Wouldn't it be great if somebody would come along and say, I got a better idea for the power cycle to connect with that or with even existing steam plant Boy, it would be wonderful if we had something better over here that would couple with this heat source that has inherent CO2 separation. All right, so that's my segue to the next part about supercritical CO2. But before we get to that, because I will talk about a different cycle, I wanted to add these last two slides here from Jeff Bergthorson. I, I did not know Jeff until uh, this spring, and uh, we ended up working on a a little project together with NSF and we started talking and we realized we had some very common interests and he has a very compelling and interesting idea. Maybe some of you will take this up, work with him, but uh, he points out metal fuels. You remember I used that expression very early when we started the talk? He points out these things could be a recyclable energy carrier, right? So the energy density, and this gets back to the comment I made about aluminum, not great as a carrier for chemical looping because I can't thermally reduce the oxide, but you can reduce it electrically, in which case it becomes a great fuel, right? I mean, for that matter, so would silicon. Silicon is silicon dioxide. You could burn it. And there are, you know, different people who've noticed this and point out the energy density is substantially higher than even conventional hydrocarbons, right? So there's people that have, for example, used aluminum directly reacting with water, all right? You're, you, you provide the oxygen to oxidize it from water. You know, the group at Purdue, how many boilermakers we got here, all right? You know, you got all right, some boilermakers here. You know, they flew a little rocket on that concept. Uh, Jeff Bergthorson at M McGill, he's got an alternative fuels lab where he's making hydrogen by that iron steam reaction 
and then you have the, the oxidized metal and you have to go somewhere else, do some other process to reduce it back again. But it's an interesting thought. You know, you can burn iron, you can burn aluminum in flames and, you know, if you collect the material up after it's been oxidized and re reduce it, it becomes an energy storage media. It's an interesting thought. So uh, he put this slide together to kind of show conceptually his notion here, you know, and making a metal fuel cycle where you take primary renewable energy, reprocess the metal oxides, and then move them around and trade them the way we do fuels today. You already have an infrastructure that moves coal around and other things. Interesting idea. Uh, Jeff is, is not bold enough to claim that we're going to be putting pulverized iron into piston engines. That's not his point. You could put it into indirect engines like steam, Rankin, those type of things, or even SCO2 with indirect heating. But uh, it's a very interesting idea. So maybe you can go read his papers, think about what you heard today, and come up with an idea. Could I use this as an energy storage media? It is not at all far out for me to think about that, particularly for small energy storage. I mean, there's people that have done this for unique niche applications just to get the thing started, right? So some things to think about, uh, courtesy uh, my, my colleague there, Jeff Bergthorson. So I told you we would talk a little bit about how do I get to higher efficiency so my heat source from chemical looping isn't just put into today's power cycle. So we'll take a look at supercritical CO2 power cycles. This is uh, not actually a new thought, but there's been a growing interest in it. A lot of literature, a couple conferences already happening. So we'll get started here by just doing a little bit of my favorite subject, thermodynamics. Here we go. We're going to be here all night now, all right? <laughs> so anyway, take a look at a, a recuperated gas turbine cycle here, all right? Let's treat it as an ideal cycle. All right. So in an ideal cycle, you know, you go through the compressor, you come through the recuperator, you get this temperature right at this point X, combustor adds the heat, go through the turbine, come over this way. In this ideal cycle, the recuperator is set up so you get this temperature exactly equal to that one. I know that doesn't happen in the real thing, right? There's got to be a temperature difference to drive that. But in an ideal world, let's take a look at that, draw a little control volume around this particular box, and you see right away there's work coming out of, you know, here. The temperature here and here is the same because the ideal cycle means the enthalpy is the same, right? For ideal gases, it's the same at those two places. So all they have is heat going in and work coming out both ends. And uh, you think about that. If you don't think about it too hard, you might be worried. I just violated the second law there. I didn't. This is not a cycle. Although the temperatures are the same here, their pressures are not the same. I need to do something to make a complete thermodynamic cycle so I don't have heat going in and work coming out, right? So it's not a cycle. But the point is, when I draw the control volume and make this assumption, if I do the same thing on this side, the heat that ends up reject, being rejected by the complete cycle when I close the loop to get back to the same set of conditions, it has to equal the compressor work. Right, this is just basic recuperated cycle thermodynamics. If it's ideal, all the heat that goes into the combustor appears as work coming out both ends, and then the heat of compression is what you reject to have a closed heat engine. Okay, is that clear? Pretty simple stuff from thermo one. What that means is in a recuperated cycle, you want lower compressor work, right? Because that's what's going to end up throwing it away to have a you know, heat engine cycle. So if somebody, you know, in practice, recuperate engines, they're typically low pressure ratio machines that because of the, what I just described here. But if somebody could come up with a clever way to reduce compression work, well, that would just be great, right? And you'd say, I, I want to go try a recuperated engine different than before. So how do I get the compressor work to go down? Well, you know, there is this new interest in alternative working fluids. Most heat engines today, air, steam, you know, 100 years of work on this stuff. Exception, organic Rankine cycles, right, for low temperature conversion. There's people that use organic working fluids, but it's still a Rankine cycle. But there's a recent literature, you go in and start to look up some of the citations I've got, you know, using supercritical carbon dioxide as a working fluid. Depending on which literature you look at, there's claims of several percentage points improvement 
projected, again, depending on the actual system configuration. You can also lay this out as a direct oxy-fuel power cycle. The CO2 at that, in that case comes out at high pressure, ready for storage, ready for transmission. And an extra benefit here, the turbo machinery is really compact, very high energy density for the turbo machinery. Uh, so it has some big advantages. It's really a combination of sort of a gas and steam turbine cycle. You know, if you think about a conventional steam turbine cycle, you don't really have hardly any compressor work, right? It's a fluid that you're pumping up at pressure. But you end up putting a lot of energy in and out of this phase change, and that's where kind of the efficiency ends up really taking a hit, right? You're just putting energy in and out of a phase change, but you have a lot of turbine work expansions. That's, that's how a steam cycle works. Brayton cycle, gas turbine cycle, conventional, you have a lot of compression work here. You put in the heat of constant pressure, you expand, and you go back again. So unlike here, where a lot of your you know, penalty comes in that phase change, here it's in the compressor, right? You just put a lot of work into compression, and then the turbine has to supply a lot to drive that compressor. So both of those cycles have pros and cons. Again, it sure would be great if somebody could find, up, find a clever way to reduce the compressor work on this configuration. And that's essentially what happens in supercritical CO2 as long as it's recuperated. All right, let's take a look at that. I'm showing here a simple uh, Brayton cycle, and to make it easy, it's just heat in and heat out. It's not like a regular gas turbine where you're burning something. You're exchanging heat into the cycle. You're pulling, rejecting heat out of the bottom of the cycle. So let's follow that around on the uh, temperature entropy diagram. We're actually above the vapor dome, but we get right close to the top of the supercritical point right there. So what ends up happening is you you know, reject heat down on this part of the curve. The compressor work here is very small because it's almost a fluid at that point, right? I mean, the stuff is highly compressed already, so to raise its pressure, I, I don't have to do a lot of work, right? Because if it was a true fluid, it takes very little pr pressure or very little work to increase that pressure. So that's where you get this idea of less compression work, but it's it's not. It's not for free in terms of the total cycle. Let me show you why here. Let's take a look at, I, I just did a little comparison where I laid out this cycle with real gas properties. In other words, I'm following this, this is the real you know, temperature entropy diagram for CO2 taken from uh, under the NIST database. So that's down this part of the, the chart. And then I just did the same set of conditions, but I used an ideal gas for the CO2. This gives you a way to compare. Well, what's the advantage of supercritical, you know, non-ideal fluids? Let's compare it here. So if I go down and I raise the stuff up 100 to 100 bar, 300 Kelvin, uh, you know, the, the compressor work here for the real gas, 24 kilojoules per kilogram specific uh, work. For the ideal gas, much more work needs to go in, about a factor of three, right? Because in that ideal case, it's a gas and you go to compress it, a lot of work got to get in there because you're actually pushing the molecules together. Then I say I want to raise that, uh, you know, up in terms of temperature to just a thousand Kelvin, the point I've got on the chart here. And so I put in the heat for the real gas and then the ideal gas. And now this is where it's interesting because for the real gas, I end up having to put in almost twice as much heat to get to that temperature. Why? Because part of the heat went into pushing the molecules apart from the supercritical state and part went into the temperature. It's almost like a phase change again. See what I'm saying? So I say it combines elements of gas turbine cycle with steam cycle all in one, one system. And then when I actually go down and look at the turbine work, it's about the same because it's, once it's up at that condition, it's almost like ideal gas expansion. But my point on the slide here is the heat addition is a lot greater. Even though the compression work is smaller, I think, oh, it's great. Less compression work. I'm set. Yeah, but you've got to put in more heat to push the molecules apart to establish the same temperature. So the efficiency will not be higher in this cycle if you put in heat from burning fuel to drive that temperature up. It'll be higher efficiency if you put in that heat as recuperated heat. 
Sometimes people don't understand this about this cycle. I want to do supercritical CO2, and they'll say, oh, it's wonderful because it takes less work to compress the supercritical CO2. I get that. But if you don't recuperate it, you're going to end up putting in more thermal energy from the fuel to drive the temperature up, right? So you have to recuperate the cycle. That's why I put the slide together to kind of lead you to that conclusion. Question, yes? What's the power density of the supercritical compared to the subcritical? Uh, the power density comparison between the turbine machinery here and between like a conventional gas turbine, I, I don't know an easy way to compare that in terms of the turbine machinery. But for example, you know, a, I wish I had a slide. There's one that shows the size of the turbines. And there, there's one for a conventional steam turbine. I've seen this image where the turbine's taller than I am, and it's easy to be taller than I am. But anyway, it's quite large. And then the same power output from a SCO2 turbine can be like yay big. Right? So the power density is very large because you're operating with this dense supercritical CO2 fluid. So I, I don't have an exact number. If you want to pursue that, one of the references actually shows that comparison directly that I had on the previous slide. But it's much higher power density. You know, the turbine here is almost like expanding a liquid. It's like, wow, there's a lot. Of, you know, it's a very high density expansion. So, uh, great question. Uh, I mentioned the need to recuperate this cycle. You have to recuperate it to achieve high efficiency. There's a subtle detail that you'll want to know about because people call this the split cycle. And, uh, this is going to be a little bit hard to understand in a time when we're kind of pressed for time here. But as you near that supercritical point, there's substantial heat being rejected as you're trying to cool that material in the recuperator. You think about the other stream, it has a different specific heat, right? Because it's at a different state on the TS diagram. You're trying to get the heat to go over to it. Well, it turns out there's a certain point you just can't get the heat to transfer anymore because you've pinched it, right? There's so much heat that you're trying to get out without much temperature change on the low pressure side you can't transfer it over and recuperate it. So what you end up doing is breaking up the recuperation into two steps. So the mass flow rate is different in two different recuperators. So that's how you get the heat to recuperate back in. That's kind of a subtle point. I went over it very quickly. I know that. But if you sit with it long enough and think about it in the TS diagram, you'll, you'll see right away, oh, I can't do it because there's so much heat coming out as I get near the critical point. It's like a phase change. It's a lot of heat coming out at one temperature where the other stream is above it and is actually being heated. And so it will heat up quickly, and you'll run into a point where you can't transfer the heat back in. So you change the mass flow to make up that difference. So it's a problem in pinch in the recuperator that you have to address. And this is how people do it. They lay it out into a split cycle. I will tell you, the recuperators for these systems, unlike the turbo machinery, they are not small. Think about it. You have to get that heat a lot of heat transferred back between the streams. So though you get an advantage in terms of the size of the turbo machinery, you do not get an advantage in terms of the size of the recuperators. They're very large recuperators. So that is a research point. If you are a heat transfer expert and can come up with a great idea to shrink the size of that recuperator, you will have a lot of people interested in your work. So that's a research topic that we are pursuing at the lab along with some of our partners. Uh, I just put this slide in, and I'm running a little short of time, but that's okay. I'm just going to, I want to point out on this slide, when you talk about supercritical CO2, I say 30 megapascals, that's 300 bars, is the top operating pressure typically for these cycles. And you take a step back, 300 bars, huh? You know, like really big rocket engines, 200 bars. This is getting a little bit high on the pressure side, right? It actually is not that far out because look at what we see in conventional steam power plants. You know, these things are operating up 25 megapascal today, so 25 bars. We're not actually that far off. So it's not like these conditions are, are, are non-obtainable, right? We do build power cycles with these kinds of pressures. It's just they are large, right? So I just want to make sure you had some sense of what we're talking about. The issues become more interesting when we talk about more advanced versions of this cycle. We want to try to go to even higher efficiency. I didn't make a clear enough point here. I drew this diagram showing the cycle with heat going in indirectly. If you recuperate that cycle, you could easily do that as an alternative to conventional steam cycle, right? 
you put that heat exchanger into a boiler, into a fluid bed combustor, into a chemical looping combustor, and now I've got potentially a higher efficiency power cycle coupled to conventional combustion, oxy-fuel combustion. But could I get to even higher efficiency if I directly fired the cycle? So instead of doing heat exchange to put my heat into the cycle, I build a combustor that burns oxygen and, you know, hydrocarbon fuel. So now I have oxy-fuel combustion directly in the cycle, the cycle that uses CO2 as a working fluid anyway, right? I recuperate it. The only thing I need to do is when I come back around the heat rejection, I can condense out water. I can condense, condense out, I can separate out at that point the CO2 that came directly from the fuel. And this part of the cycle is still operating at 100 atmospheres. So now I have the CO2 already at high pressure. I didn't pay anything to compress it. It's part of the cycle. Catch is, I did have to compress the oxygen and the fuel. Right? You can't get away from that. But still, the CO2, you don't need a separate compression step here, comes out right at high pressure. Innovative idea. So, you know, come CO2 comes out, it's ready for storage. You vent out the CO2 that came in with the carbon on that part. You know, CO2 is directly there. Interesting, interesting idea. But what if you're the person who has to build the combustor? I mean, that's what this is, the summer school on combustion. You know, right? I got to build a combustor for this thing. Well, I wish I could tell you we had this all worked right out and here's all the stuff to do, but this is an emerging technology and uh, there has been a combustor, a combustor test at these conditions. I'm not aware of many more than a singular one right now. Um, but there are a number of combustion fundamentals that are different and you'll give you a chance to react and kind of speak to that here in just a second. But this is what you got to do for that combustor. Complete combustion, right? Why? Because I don't want, after I do the condensate stream over here, if I don't have complete combustion, you know what's coming out here? Carbon monoxide, hydrogen, stuff I really don't want in the stream. I'm saying I'm going to go off to sequestration. I don't have good fuel conversion. I've got to do good conversion of that fuel in a stream that basically is diluted with CO2. You ever try and build a combustor with like a whole bunch of CO2 in the stream? I mean, that's the stuff that reverts back to carbon monoxide, right? And the other thing is, you don't want any excess oxygen. You know, if you do turbine combustion, you don't even think about that, right? 15% oxygen, is, you know, there's plenty of oxygen. If you build even a conventional coal boiler, you know, the kind of de minimis point is 2 to 3% excess oxygen. So I think about using up any CO that's residual. It's not that big a problem. You've got to worry about it. Here, I, you know, I don't really want any excess oxygen. There's a very insidious little problem with excess oxygen floating around this system, right? It, uh, it comes back through as part of the cycle here, and it has to go through these compressors. And remember, the big advantage here was the low compression energy for supercritical CO2. I put in a diatomic that's far removed from its supercritical point. Guess what happens to my low compression energy, right? It doesn't, it doesn't compress the same way as my point. You don't want extra molecules in there. You want to be compressing CO2 at that point. So you really would like a combustor with all these very extreme conditions on it. Remember I talked about being resilient and flexible? I mean, to me, if you can't turn the thing down 50%, you're not in the game right now. It's got to be able to move around the wind energy that's on the grid, right? So you got to have good turn down. 300 bar pressure, well, that's interesting. It's up at rocket engine conditions. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is the inlet temperature for the combustor, if you look at the way it's laid out, it ends up turning out to be close to the turbine exit temperature. That, that's not really unlike a recuperated engine today, but it's just, it's an issue you got to deal with because you're going to be trying to mix that fuel and air and oxygen right in that stream that's already at high temperature. So it's, a, it's an interesting design problem. And don't forget, if that wasn't enough, you need to light it. You know, I'm, I'm, I love theory, you know, all kinds of stuff. I really do. Uh, but I, I, before I went into engineering, I was a motorcycle mechanic. So I'm also very practical. 
And I always tell students that are working in combustion area, the, about the only thing I've actually learned that's useful in combustion is when you design the thing, you have to light it. And, and so if you are actually working in a company or something, you get a new combustor design, I'm just giving you free advice here that write it down and take it to the bank. You're going to end up designing the thing around how you light it. And typically people do not start that way if they work in like a practical environment, if they came out of school, right? But if you're going to do practical combustor design, I've struggled more with like research combustors that we couldn't light than anything else. You know, the one I showed you that we did in that hypersonic wind tunnel, uh, we were sweating bullets on the igniter design. And when we got there, that was the most difficult part, getting the igniter design right. So, so just some free advice there. Uh, it needs to stay lit, <laughs> you know. I guess that's a given, but sometimes it'll go out and you better know what's going to happen the moment it goes out with the rest of the engine cycle. Because if the compressor surges at that point, uh, there'll be a lot of people who get nervous uh, and it, it, it can't happen if you got a lot of volume between the compressor and the turbine. So you need to know what's going to happen if the thing goes out. What, by the way, what about NOx in this cycle? NOx? What do you think about that? I've seen people doing research in this area. Oh, I'm going to do NOx production and oxy fuel combustion. What about it? What's that? There would be NOx if you have nitrogen coming in. Yeah, there won't be any. If you, if, obviously, if you have pure oxygen, you're probably going to have a little bit of nitrogen from the air separation unit coming in there. But I'm not sure why people are really worried about NOx too much here. If you're going to take the stream, the non condensables out and sequester them, you're not going to vent it into the air. You might have to worry more about NOx because of, like when you do the condensing, forming acids. But frankly, I would be more worried about the CO2 in that regard. All right, so, so you just need to think about, like, do I have to worry about NOx production from a little bit of nitrogen? Depends on the rest of the system and what you're going to do at the end of the day, right? But probably not as big an issue in my mind. i got plenty of other things to worry about. So a question for you all, what combustion fundamentals are going to differ here versus other technologies we're, we're working on today? What are a couple fundamentals that maybe we don't know so well here? Anybody? What would you start working on? You might have to. You don't know. <laughs> right? Different combustion fundamentals. Anybody? It looks like a very heavy and heavy hard combustor. So yeah. you might not expect to see that like one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very different set of combustion conditions. So what are the kinetics, right? I don't know. I can tell you where the equilibrium sits easily, but what are the actual kinetics of conversion? I don't know. We have people right now measuring these. There was somebody here from University of Central Florida, Saha. I don't think he's in the room. Anyway, we, University of Central Florida, uh, Professor, uh, is working on some kinetics there. Anything else in terms of combustion fundamentals? Yeah. Yeah, the heat transfer is different in many regards, even in the like downstream portion of the cycle where you're starting to get to conditions in the recuperator where you're nearing supercritical point. What's the heat transfer coefficient for supercritical cooling? I don't know. Well, of course we were in a hurry. So they said, Well, can I even design a combustor for this thing? Well, let's just take what we know and put together a simulation. I'm not saying that this is at all what would happen, but we just needed to know what would the thing look like. So we took a, a grid that we had for a combustor that we actually run in the lab on air. We jacked it up in the simulation to 300 bar. We put in the oxy, oxygen, and I think this was methane fuel. Just This is not sophisticated. Just use out-of-the-box CFD, put in the design you want, and convert it to supercritical CO2 and just see, well, what happens? Help us get our feet wet in terms of how this thing behaves. So. Uh, here was the trial case that we did, the geometry I just showed you. And uh, this was the very first thing we started to notice when we ran the simulation. Boy, did we get combustion dynamics. <laughs> you can see the flame is just like flapping around in there. There's a uh, spinning mode inside of the combustor. And I don't know, I, we, I didn't want to start something here and tell you the amplitude of the oscillation here because there's no guarantee this would happen in the real world because 
we have just assumed kinetics, we have assumed a lot of things, but you know when you're running a combustor at 300 bars, a 1% pressure fluctuation is how many bars? Three bars? You really want to avoid combustion dynamics because this is rocket engine conditions, right? And you know rocket engines have lots of issues with dynamics. So you do not want to overlook the possibility of dynamics in this system. The com oxy fuel combustor that I showed you that we tested in at a hypersonic facility, because I, a long time ago, really did a lot of combustion dynamics, I designed that one to be stable from day one. It was the first thing on my mind after where do I put the igniter, the next question was how do I make sure it's stable. So we broke up the oxygen injection and avoided any coupling there. We used a diffusion flame. This is a premix flame. We did all the tricks we knew to make it stable and it was rock steady. So we had fun looking at that one. We said we don't want to do that. So my colleague Pete Strakey put together a combustor design. You can see multi-injector combustor. It, it actually is modeled after a combustor that he's familiar with from the space shuttle main engine booster pump. And we ran that simulation. It was rock steady. All right. So smart understanding of the issues coupled with good design take away some problems, right? So all these things you're learning, they really matter, right? You don't want to be the one that designs it without thinking through that set of issues. How do I avoid every one of those issues before we cut metal, right? That's why you're need to focus on all these fundamentals because you know you don't want to be the one oscillating a combustor around. By the way, in terms of unique conditions, I plotted up here on a Borgi plot. From this simulation, we just went in and measured you know, turbulent velocity fluctuations to laminar flame speed, length of the eddies we saw from the simulation versus the, the flame thickness, and then plotted those up on a kind of a traditional Borgi diagram. Look where they look where they sit relative to like gas turbine conditions or internal engine combustion conditions way up here because the you know the Kolmogorov scales are just like nothing you know so you have this unusual regime of turbulent reacting flow that you just probably haven't seen in other engine cycles so just telling me that it's a little bit different environment to be working in so I guess there's a dinner and I'm it's like right at 5 30 so this will either give you something to talk about or indigestion, right? Uh, you can go think about the technologies you heard about today. What do they do for these different issues that we started off with, right? I have my opinion where they land on that chart. And I'll be honest, some I'm worried about some of these issues. Some I think, yeah, I think we really got that one nailed. But th these each play a role in terms of where the technology development is going to go. So you can think about it, you know, and, uh, and, and be warned, tomorrow we'll come back here and we'll talk about some even more far out types of things. Rotating detonations, MHD power extraction, pulse detonation engines, really cool things. Look, I'm just advertising because otherwise you might go home, right? It's Friday, but we'll, we'll try and make it interesting tomorrow afternoon, but we'll start with just get your views. How are we doing on this chart? Because we'll do the same thing when we look at those other technologies. So uh, I can stay and answer questions, but probably everybody wants to go and eat. So maybe if you got a question, just come up and talk to me. But for everybody else, we can just go. So oh, go ahead. Or if you want to. What's that? Previous slide. Previous slide. One, one on the previous. Yes. For the combustion diagram, you have some um, circle inside the broken reaction. Um, this is for premixed, it's not for non premixed, so I'm just plotting up what we found at these set of conditions turbulent velocity fluctuations divided by laminar flame speed, where we pull that out of a, a textbook. So I'm just trying to place where is the combustion on that regime, you know, for, for conventional engines and then for, you know, two different conditions for oxy fuel. So. But I can, we can talk more directly. I'm going to conclude for now, so.